Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to today's mentoring art. Today we have uh, Jean George, who will be sharing with us on the subject of grief and how to cope with it. Uh, so after the presentation, uh, we can clarify our doubts and queries on this subject. Uh, the faculty is here, and uh, Jean will help us in addressing these questions. Uh, so let's begin now with a word of prayer. If we could have one of the students uh, Start with a word of prayer, please. Praise the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this prayer time. God bless this mentoring hour. Help us, Lord, to learn about grief and how to cope with grief. Lord, utilize the message giving person, Jean George, mightily and help to learn about grief and to manage the grief successfully in our spiritual life. Help all hearers, audience of this message and bless this mentoring hour from starting to ending. In Lord Jesus' name, we pray God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. Yes. Jean, if you could uh, take over the session, please. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Deepika. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, yeah, I'm really glad that we're all here today to uh, look at a very important topic, uh, something that we all uh, may need to hear about as well as understand. So um, what I'd like to do through today's um, uh, session, the 10 minutes, is I just want to give maybe a quick introduction about what grief is. Uh, look at a couple of examples of grief in the Bible. Where do we see grief in the Bible? It's just a quick gloss over. What have been some of the responses of grief in the Bible? Uh, we look at some stages of grief. And lastly, what can we do as ministers? How do we minister um, to people who are going through bereavement? All right. So before um, we, we get to understand it, um, maybe as a reflection, we all have faced grief at some points of our lives. It could probably be the loss of a loved one. It could be the loss of something significant, maybe like a relationship or a job. Or it could be something that has really changed our familiar and our normal way of living. So what is grief? This grief is a uh, human experience, and it is a universal human experience. It is a natural response to some significant loss. So coping with the loss of someone or something you love can be a very big challenge um, in our lives. So grief is not a linear process, but it is rather a journey which has its ups and downs. So grief is um, most commonly, generally, we know grief uh, associated with the death of a loved one, but grief can also arise from other uh, life altering events like the loss of a relationship, loss of a job, uh, loss of health, or even something like a major life transition like a divorce or the loss of health. Um, so grief basically is the, uh, is, is the emotional or uh, experience that one goes through and it can also have psychological and physical reactions to whatever loss we may be going through which affects every part of the person's life so just to understand a little bit more about uh, maybe certain facts about grief because sometimes we operate with a lot of myths um, so some of the facts that that maybe I just want to quickly highlight is that grief is very personal which means it can come or be manifested in very different ways for each individual. So some may experience intense sadness, while others might experience different kind of emotions, maybe like anger or guilt or confusion, or sometimes uh, even a sense of relief, maybe for someone who's probably going through, as a caretaker, going through very troubled uh, times with probably the person who's passed away. Some people could even experience a sense of relief. So there is no right or wrong way to gr uh, grieve because it is very personal in the way that someone may take it. Uh, it's also important to remember that it is normal, uh, grief is normal, and 
it is essential to grieve when we have a loss uh, quite contrary to what we we may be told that you know when someone is uh, someone has passed away to be strong uh, to to not cry to not break down in fact crying is a way of releasing what may be what you may be feeling at a time of grief now grief is also a necessary part of healing after the loss has taken place and it's important to give yourself the time and the space to experience uh, those emotions and and the and the grief that comes about to also understand that grieving takes time um, and healing happens gradually it's not something that we can force or we can hurry and again there is probably no normal timetable for grieving you you don't look you don't compare your grieving with somebody else's saying hey i just took maybe a week to get over and you're taking a couple of a couple of weeks a couple of months so there isn't a timetable for for grieving um the next thing that i want to look at is um uh, sorry i think i missed a slide right the next thing that i want to look at is certain examples of of grief and the bible has many examples um, of grief showing how various individuals experienced and expressed sorrow so um, and i've taken just a few there may be a lot more but i've just taken a few uh, the first one that we look at is david's grief for his son now after david's son who was born to bathsheba became ill and died um, we see david fasted he wept and pleaded with god to to spare his child's life but once the child passed uh, david grieved but he accepts god's decision and he says in second samuel 12:23 i will go to him but he will not return to me so this can shows us the depth of david's sorrow but finally his submission to to the will of god uh, the second example we can look at is job and that's uh, uh, often looked at um, when we talk about grief so the grief that job had over over his many losses so he experienced that intense grief after losing his children his wealth and finally uh, it went down to even his health we see that he tore his robe shaved his head he sat in ashes mourning uh, those losses so we see that throughout the book of job how job is actually wrestling uh, with grief through the quest through the many questions that he has the next example we can look at is jesus weeping for lazarus now even though jesus knew he would raise lazarus from the dead he was deeply moved by the grief of lazarus the the sisters grieving mary and martha and the mourning crowd um and we read that uh, in the verse jesus wept so this also demonstrate how even in spite of jesus knowing that that the raising was going to happen he demonstrated empathy and shared the sorrow with those around even though uh, jesus had was holding the power to overcome death another example that we look at is naomi Naomi's grief um, at the loss of her husband and her two sons, where she's left feeling bitter and abandoned. And you see in her grief, she expresses her sorrow so openly. She says, call me Mara, because uh, the Lord has made my life very bitter. She's actually very openly expressing what, she is, what she's experiencing. Another example that we can look at is Jeremiah. Uh, where Jeremiah is lamenting for Jerusalem. He, uh, Jeremiah is uh, grieving very deeply over the destruction that happens over Jerusalem. This is something different from maybe the loss of a person. And if you look at the entire book of Lamentations, it's an expression of his sorrow as he mourned that suffering and exile of the people. And he says in Lamentations 1 to 12, is it nothing to you, all you who, who pass by, look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. And this grief is being reflected in the love for his people and, and for the city. Uh, another example we can look at is Mary, Mary's grief at the cross, where Mary stood at the cross, uh, at the foot of the cross and seeing Jesus crucified. Though uh, the Gospels do not detail what her emotions uh, are, but you, you and I can imagine her deep sorrow as a mother watching her son suffer and die. Um, and over here we see that Jesus even acknowledges her grief and, and entrusts her to, uh, to his favorite disciple, John. The last one we can look at is David's uh, grief over Absalom. 
um, after David's uh, son, uh, who was who was extremely rebellious, uh, was killed in battle. Absalom was killed in battle. David was deeply grieved, and he laments. He said, "Oh my son, oh my son! If only I had died instead of you." So the Bible very beautifully portrays grief in all of its complexity, and it also gives hope and comfort in God's presence to those who may be uh, uh, suffering. Uh, we'll just again look back into the Bible at what are some of the responses of people who've undergone grief. Um, so we do see some outward expressions of grief. Um, uh, for Job, after he lost his children, his livestock, his servants, what did Job do? He tore his clothes, shaved his head, fell to the ground in worship. And um, so in, in, in those times, tearing one's clothes and wearing sackcloth were common practices um, to demonstrate that deep sense of grief and mourning and repentance. So there are outward expressions that we see in the Bible, which is a normal response to grief. Another, um, another response that we see is weeping and lamenting. We see, uh, again, Jesus openly weeping after arriving at Lazarus' tomb. And um, Jeremiah also records about Rachel symbolically representing all the mothers of Israel weeping at the loss of their children uh, during, uh, uh, during um, the time of um, uh, their exile in Egypt. So it shows of that weeping and lamenting uh, the, again, which is a normal response. A third response you see is how uh, David often cries out to God in his grief, expressing his sorrow, uh, crying out in prayer in that confusion and frustration. Psalm 13, 1 and 2 says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with these thoughts So and, and have sorrow in my heart? So you see that crying out in prayer is something that the Bible talks about in response to grief. The fourth one we see is seeking solitude. We see in Matthew 14, 13, how Jesus, after hearing about the uh, execution of John the Baptist, he withdraws to a solitary place. He moves away to a solitary place uh, to grieve. Uh, the fifth um, response we see is the, the trust that people have put in God. Again, we go back to David when he um, when the child that is born from Bathsheba dies, he responds by accepting God's decision. After that fasting and pleading with God for the child's life, he gets up, washes his uh, washes himself, and worships the Lord after the child's death. So, so the response has been a trust in God and worship. And the sixth one uh, we can look at is seeking comfort from others. And we see this in Job, where Job's friends responded appropriately by sitting around him uh, in silence for almost seven days, recognizing how deep uh, the loss and, and the depth of his grief was. Okay. Um, to just move forward, uh, I'd like to look at what are some of the stages of grief. And again, when we're looking at this, uh, I'm going back to uh, just point that grief is described as a process because it, because it involves moving through a, a series of emotions rather than just maybe one emotion. So the stages of grief that you see is a fr framework that is developed by a person by uh, named Kubler-Ross um, in her work with terminally ill patients. And uh, this has been widely used uh, and applied to even other type of loss. While this can give you a good understanding of grief, it's important to understand that not everyone experiences these stages in order and not everyone goes through all of them. And it doesn't mean that if one person has gone through one of these emotions, they will never go back to it. So it's it's uh, it can also be seen as a sometimes a kind of a circular kind of a framework. But all of these emotions that you see are absolutely normal and expected. So um, some of the stages that we see is a place where there is a uh, a sense of denial, a sense that says, "Oh, this can't be happening. This." Uh, I, I'm in a dream. This isn't. This doesn't seem real. So in this stage, the person is in shock. 
or almost disbelief. And they may find it quite hard to accept that reality of the loss. And this sometimes is like a mechanism to numb that initial pain. And so this is something that you may be seeing in people, especially when there is an unexpected loss and um, uh, that, sta that state of denial and numbness that may be there. The next stage that they can move into is anger in the sense of asking, why did this happen? And who is there to blame? Am I to blame? Is there someone else to blame? So as this reality of the loss sets in, uh, sometimes anger can come about. And this can be directed towards others, towards the person who passed away, towards oneself, or even to God. It's a way of expressing that pain and frustration of that loss. The third uh, stage that you may see is bargaining. Bargaining, which means uh, they try to negotiate or make some deals to reverse or lessen that loss. So it's generally, if only this person come back, then I would do this. Or if what if this person comes back, then I will ensure that I will do something. So they generally dwell on what could have been done differently in order to prevent the loss, that hoping that there would be a different outcome. The next stage is uh, uh, a sense of depression, where um, they feel extremely sad and, and feel a huge sense of despair and hopelessness uh, and intense sadness. So the full weight of the loss actually begins to seep in, it begins to sink in. And the person withdraws from life, from different things, just feeling extremely overwhelmed by the pain. And the last stage is the stage of acceptance. So it is in this final stage that they come to terms with the reality of the loss. So it doesn't mean that the pain is completely gone, but they have found a way to move forward and begin to live with that reality. So it's a sense of saying, I can get through this, or it will be OK. I, I know that I will find a way. God is with me. So that's that stage of acceptance that, that comes about. Um, the last, uh, what I'd like to end with is to look at how do we minister, because we are all going to be facing this situation, uh, not just in our, our own lives, but also in the lives of people we minister to. So how do we minister? Now, sometimes ministering to um, those going through grief um, uh, as a Christian, uh, sometimes can be, it can feel very awkward because it's not something we may be used to or how do we respond. And very often what we may tend to do is to keep away. But as a believer, as a Christian, it requires compassion, it requires empathy, it requires patience, and it requires your presence. So here are just a few ways that we can effectively minister. The first one is actually just being present and listen. Sometimes the best thing one can do is simply just being there. Like you see in Job's friends who initially sat with him in silence for uh, uh, to just offer that comfort without even saying anything. Okay, So listening sometimes is often much more valuable than speaking when it comes to grief. So be sensitive to the grieving person as they share their feelings, or they may just want to remain silent. So as James 1.19 says, be quick to listen and be slow to speak. And this is quite applicable even when, uh, as we minister to someone in grief. What is the second thing we can do? Is acknowledging their pain or validating their feelings. When you allow the grieving person to actually express their emotions, um, you do. It, you should be doing it without a, without judgment. Uh, be careful not to minimize their pain or don't rush um, to help them through that grieving process and help them to get better. Grieving is very different for everyone, and it's important to acknowledge that the loss that they are feeling is absolutely significant. So when you share in their sorrow, as it says in Romans, mourn with those who mourn. When you share in their sorrow, you help them feel understood and supported, and that you are there journeying with them through, through the situation. The third thing that we can do is to be patient with the process, because grief takes time. And people don't move on from grief in a set time. So be patient and understanding as they're navigating that journey. So avoid using um, uh, cliches or words like, you know, time will heal, 
or it is God's will. Or, um, you know, this sometimes can feel quite dismissive. So it's important to recognize that the grieving process is different for everyone. And there is a time for everything, time to weep and a time to heal. And the fourth thing that we can do is to pray. Pray for that comfort and strength. Pray with them and for them. And so um, we, we see that when people who are going through bereavement can struggle to pray or to express their emotions to God. So you can pray with them, asking for God's peace and comfort, because we know that God promises to be near those who are brokenhearted. And so we can be there interceding for them during this time. The fifth thing we can do is to yes, share scripture and offer promises from the word. Now, scripture gives so many comfort, so, so many verses of comfort, reminding us that God is with us in our suffering. So Psalm 23, or, or um, uh, the verse that says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Some of this can bring in a lot of hope and remind the, uh, the person that God really cares. Um, uh, the, the next thing we can actually do, which is very practical, is to actually offer practical help. So grief sometimes can leave people feeling very exhausted and overwhelmed, uh, unable to think about what they could do. So offering practical help, such, such as maybe preparing a meal or running errands or helping with some household chores or doing some kind of background work that needs to be done, can relieve some of the uh, burdens that they may have and give them that space to uh, space to grieve. So when you help them with practical tasks, you're actually uh, bringing about love in action. The uh, next thing you can do is help them stay connected. Sometimes in grief, isolation uh, can deepen the sense of grief. So encourage the persons to stay connected uh, with their uh, with their church, with their faith community, or maybe people who support them gently. Maybe sometimes inviting them to gatherings um, without really pressurizing them. So when they are part of a loving community, there is definitely strength and encouragement that happens during difficult times. Um, uh, we also want, would like to gently keep reminding the person that God is even that God is present uh, in their um, uh, in their pain, that He understands their grief um, because of of what what God Himself did of sending Jesus to die uh, for us. Um, we we also through the grieving process continue to offer hope in eternal life. So the the we point to the hope of resurrection and for us as believers grief is tempered by the hope of that eternal life in christ while uh, it's important not to downplay their current pain you gently remind them of that eternal promise that death is not the end for all of us who trust in jesus and lastly it is to avoid comparisons and respect that journey that they may be going through because grief is personal and comparing one's grief to another can be quite painful. So avoid saying things like, I know how you feel, unless you really do. And uh, even then, acknowledge that their experience is, um, uh, is quite unique. So just in conclusion, as we've understood this, when we minister to someone in grief, it is a, it is a responsibility that each of us have. But it needs to be done with sensitivity, with love, and of course, the absolute reliance on the Holy Spirit. So when you're present, when you pray, when you share God's word, when you offer practical help, you are actually showing out the compassion and the comfort that, um, that we ought to be giving in a time of deep sorrow. So letting the person know that God is near and that through faith that we have the hope of eternal life and that uh, we, we, we will get through with the leading and the, and the grace of, of God. Uh, thank you, Deepika. Uh, back over to you. Deepika? Um, uh, probably Deepika is away. Um, since we've heard about what we have, uh, you know, we've just gone through these different pointers on grief. Um, if there are any questions that you'd like to ask, you could probably put that on the chat. Um, or, uh, yeah, you could just unmute and bring about your question. <laughs> 
feel free to even put down other questions if not if it's not uh, on the topic on grief please feel free to put down other questions if you may need okay there's a question from visitra it says how to how do we overcome grief when we are alone and no one is there to help you right visitra um that's the yeah, actually grief is a process or or a, or the emotions the response that comes um that really needs um, and probably the healing gets faster when you are in some form of a community. Um, however, if uh, we, we know that there may be certain situations when people are probably alone, uh, people have not, uh, maybe in families, people are alone and they do uh, experience that grief. I, it is absolutely important to... Um, uh, even when you're going through those emotions and you know that you are alone to really reach out to someone who can journey alongside with you now this can be anyone absolutely it can be someone uh, maybe as a friend or a or a church member or a pastor or a counselor someone who can journey this uh, alongside with you mm, especially when you know that being alone there are many emotions that you could be experiencing that put you in a in a state of extreme despair and sometimes hopelessness and not being able to voice that out can uh, can be uh, a, a, a struggle so it is needed to reach out to anybody who can who can support so if again if there isn't a family member or a community that one may be part of um, you have people, Christian counselors, uh, who you can reach out to really share and um, process the grief. So knowing that you are alone should probably move you to get some support at somewhere because grieving uh, almost, you know, if, if you look at in different cultures, uh, mourning becomes a cultural affair that, you know, you, you invite people uh, in different cultures, it's different. But you invite people maybe for a prayer and then uh, together talk about the person, talk about God's presence. So all of this, it is a community affair also. So if you if you are alone, it's good to reach out to somebody um, to get that support. I hope I answered that question, Visitra. All right, Deepika, are you back? All right, I'll, I think I'll just take on the next question. Uh, it says, I'm thinking about ministering to a non-believer. What is the focus or how do you progress? Uh, Mwai, uh, so it is, it's very similar. Uh, there isn't anything different that you do uh, when you are supporting an unbeliever. And I, if we look back at the, um, at how to minister, Sometimes it's, you know, most of the times it's your physical presence that is most required. So just being with them, maybe in silence, supporting them through uh, those initial few days, um, uh, allowing them to maybe talk about it, to, to discuss about the person is a very helpful thing. Uh, and I don't think there's anything that stops us from actually asking the person maybe, you know, in a couple of, maybe in, uh, after a day or two or so to, you know, can I pray with you? Can I just uh, uh, stand alongside with you and pray with you? Or just assuring them the prayer uh, is what is needed. Uh, or even sometimes sharing uh, a verse from the Bible that can be encouraging, which says the Lord is the one who brings comfort. The Lord will is, is our strength. So to be able to minister that way is um, is also possible, just like how you would minister to a non-believer on any other kind of an occasion, where you may need to ask their permission if you can you can pray and uh, maybe encourage them with some verses. Sometimes asking a permission may be, may be okay, because um, we don't understand what state they may be in, but actually helping them to open up and converse about what some of those emotions may, they may be going through can be absolutely helpful. Okay. Um, sure, Pastor Nancy, I'll, I'll take this on. Um, I hope that helped, uh, Maui. 
Okay, we'll go and through. I have a question. Yes, I would want to ask um, if three years down the line, the person is still mourning, the pain is still very low, and they they are still talking about this person as if the person, the person who is deceased, as if they are still alive. And they also talk of having dreams, communing with this person. What, what would you comment about that? Uh, Julian, I'm sorry, I did not follow your question. Could you please repeat your question and maybe a little slower? I'm trying to okay. really understand. Yeah. Okay. I am asking uh, a person who is mourning three years down the line. They are still grieving. The pain is still very raw. Okay. And they talk as if the person who has deceased is still very present in their lives okay and they also talk of dreaming with dreams that come while they are communing with this person okay how do you deal with that all right thank you yeah i, I understood your question thank you juliana for your patience so um we need to understand that uh grief uh, can sometimes become what we call as complicated. Complicated grief is when a person has not come to a place of accepting that reality. And uh, how do we know that is through, if, if it affects the different functioning in their lives, maybe their uh, their sleep, their biological functioning. Now, as you said, yes, the person has ha uh, is having dreams of the person who's deceased and they're pretending to um, uh, or, or they, they seem to feel that the person is still alive and communing with them. So that again is a dysfunction in things that you would expect to be normal, whether it's in their social functioning or in their biological functioning. When you do see that it has affected different areas of their lives, so much so that it brings distress in them. Um, uh, continuing with a normal pattern of life, that's when you call it a complicated grief. And which means it's probably they are still stuck in a reality that is uh, that is not that is not real. They're still stuck in a place which is not reality. And that calls for help. Uh, and sometimes this can come in as a result of the intense grief can lead into prolonged depression. And that's when you do find that grief has become complicated and you take on, um, uh, you, you get them to seek help. When they have not come to that place of a reality check that the person is not there anymore, they're still living in that place of um, uh, dysfunctional grief. So that's when you call as complicated grief. That's an indication that they need uh, uh, further support and help. I hope that answered your question, Juliana. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Okay. So uh, Jeevan has asked, if someone is going through grief over a year, is that part of the process or is it more serious than grief? So as, as I think I partly answered that question, Jeevan, is when you look at normal grief, and as I said, there is probably no time, but you generally do see grief kind of subsiding or coming to a place of acceptance between six to nine months to mostly a year. And anything beyond that, and if it has some of these things that I spoke about, where there is a dysfunction in a person's functioning in their uh, social functioning, maybe in their work, maybe in their um, in their general uh, uh, living of life, that's when you know it's much more serious than grief and it becomes pathological grief or complicated grief, which means it has a, um, let's say, a, a, a disorder pattern to it. And that's when they need to seek some help and support. I hope I answered that, Jeevan. Uh, Deepika, would you, if you want to continue, you can take it on. Yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, it, it just um, got disconnected. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, there are no further questions here in the chat, but please do post your questions uh, or you can unmute. Deepika, there's one more question. I think since you just joined in, there's one more question that's come in by Visitra. It's uh, is asked how to strengthen our faith in God when we are in grief? 
uh, that's a question. How do we strengthen our faith in God when we are in grief? Okay, so Visitra, um, the, the truth and the important thing is to be real before God, to bring about any all and any of our emotions to God and not to pretend because God knows the depth of our grief and the depth of our pain. Um, so even, you know, when we are, uh, as, as we are told to be strong in God, yes, that is important. But it is also important for us to be vulnerable with God, which means, and you see that in the Psalms where David actually talks about all of his emotions uh, with absolutely um, no filter. You know, he's very candid about what he's going through. And so you strengthen your faith in God when you're actually sharing in, in, in absolute uh, vulnerability before God. So as you keep doing that, you also take the time to go back and strengthen your spirit, right? To go back to the word and strengthen and look at the comfort that God's given us. Look at the hope that we have, the eternal hope that we have. So we do both. We, we are absolutely real and vulnerable. And at the same time, we strengthen our faith by going back to the word, continuously meditating on God's word and encouraging our heart uh, with, with the word of God. So it's a, it's a process that, again, that we continue doing. All right. Yeah, you can take over. Um, yeah, I think. yeah. Does, does that help, Visitra? I mean, uh, if you have a follow-up question, you can post it. Otherwise, we can uh, move to the next question. Jeevan has a question. Uh, he writes, what if someone is in grief and they do not want to be treated with therapy uh, and they want to overcome with just scripture and faith? Is that valid? OK, thank you, Jeevan. Absolutely. It doesn't mean that someone going through grief has to go through counseling or therapy. It is not needed. If you are able to overcome that with, with just uh, uh, seeking God, with probably a community of believers and standing in faith, that's absolutely uh, wonderful. I think I spoke about this earlier, is when, the, uh, when it can seem, uh, maybe let's say a person has gone into depression, uh, it's it's definitely indicated that they get the support and the help, but in case they do not want to, and if they are able to take that support um, through scripture and faith, that itself is uh, is a good thing. Um, but I think as a bystander or as a family member uh, or a friend, to really look in to see how are they coping, and it's perfectly okay to get. A medical support or um, counseling support during that time. Sometimes it's a, it's a mind block or it's a perception that if I do take extra help, um, maybe in the time of my situation or in my grief, it questions the faith that I have in God. So some, some of these are misconceptions that we may have and which, which need to be broken down that all because we are in a place of sadness, deep sadness or deep grief, uh, that does not uh, in any way um, uh, impact how we take our faith or the way that we see our faith in God. You know, we, we are called to respond to others who, who are in distress or carry each other's burdens. So sometimes it's that misconception that, that can be broken down and people may be ready to, to get external support, uh, especially in, on those who have this complicated or pathological grief. Jeevan, does that help? Yes. Yeah. All right, then. In that case, uh, we'll move on to Moai's question. Uh, he asks, what about the spiritual risk which is brought about during grief? Uh, how would we handle that? Um, so just to understand a little better, would you help me understand what you mean by spiritual risk, Maui? What, what, what I mean, Jean, is that, uh, for example, one of the expression of grief is anger. And uh, in other instances, you find that there are people who completely disconnect with God at that time or later. And finally, you find that... Uh, the spiritual, the spiritual warfare of the person is actually worse off after 
going through the grief incidents? W what are the issues around there? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So I think as we spoke about, uh, when you look at those the stages of grief, uh, some of that comes at the place of anger, where um, your the the again I wouldn't say it is a, it is a risk, but definitely it is an impact of of their spiritual faith. The fact that they um, they question God, they question whether His protection question uh, his overlook, his oversight on things. And that can often happen, especially when um, uh, grief happens all of a sudden or when it, uh, sorry, when death happens all of a sudden and when it is unexpected. Um, but again, that is a part of the process. And that's where community really helps, uh, especially when when you do connect with someone who you see is probably going through this spiritual impact, just being with them and helping them converse, helping them vent, helping them share, actually brings them to a place of a greater understanding. Uh, so to do this with, and, and that's why as community, we need to support that time when they are mourning that. Again, it may be needed that as a, as a helper, as someone who is supporting them, to not dismiss what they may be going through. They're actually sharing and, and bringing about what is very intense for them. So it is to, it is to just keep encouraging them, maybe in things like, uh, I understand what you're experiencing, or I see that you're experiencing um, this, this um, uh, disconnection with God about whatever is going through. But when you're there actually just listening and bringing about support, maybe through some scripture um, and not talking down to them, it actually helps to air that out. And over time, you will find that some of that, you know, as, as, uh, as they move away from that stage of more into a place of acceptance, some of that will return. Uh, and that's why community is extremely important in situations like this. Does that answer the question why? Yes, yes, fine, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Venkateshan has a question. Is it possible to live without grief in Christian life? Uh, okay, Venkateshan, um, grief, like I said, is a normal response to a loss. And it is human to grieve. And we do see that in the Bible. And I think we brought about a whole lot of examples. Uh, if we love a person, we will miss the person and we will grieve. Uh, so it's, I, th I think the questions may be similar to asking, um, you know, can I, can I, can I be happy uh, or, or should I be happy in Christian life, right? It, some of these emotions are God-given and it is, it's there as part, part of us. So you will experience grief. Maybe your grief may be shorter because of the hope that you have the continuous hope that that uh, you may uh, you may be uh, looking into and meditating on so uh, i think grief makes life or grief makes that death and dying process a lot more um, what do i say real right when we experience grief we are really experiencing this life that god's given us so uh, i i would say maybe it's better that we grieve rather than living a life without grief as a Christian. I don't know if any of the other pastors have a different take on it. Um, please, I'm just anyone who'd like to bring about some thoughts. Um, yeah, Jean, just a quick thought about um, the fact that uh, grief is something that we experience because of the fall. Uh, just, um, just my thought that grief is on this side of eternity, uh, it's earthbound. And as long as we are here on, on earth, because of the fall, uh, we will experience grief. Um, so that was, um, that was something that uh, I just uh, thought that, yes, um, when we move on to the other side of eternity, when we move on from, the, uh, from here, the earthly life, then the Bible talks about no more pain, no more no grief. 
So um, that's another reality as well. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Venkateshan, does that help? Or do you have any follow-up question? OK, uh, this is enough. I think uh, our Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. But uh, we are facing grief in life. At any time, the grief may come in our life. I feel uh, in Christian life and uh, non-Christian life, uh, people are normally facing grief in their life. Whenever it may come, whenever it may go. Uh, this is a possibility uh, in human life. But the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, in some situations, uh, we face grief and communicate our grief to the Lord. And the Lord himself solves our problem. This is the reality. So the grief scenario or situation or atmosphere may come to any Christian, any minister of God, any believer or any non-Christian also in this life. Uh, in many situations, we are ready to face the power of grief by the spirit of holiness or by the spirit of God. Through by the spirit of God only, we can overcome the power of grief. This That's is my true, yes, humble yeah. opinion. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your thoughts on this. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, but then we are out of time. Uh, Jean, would it be possible to answer just one more question? Does time heal? Uh, you know, it, as it's a uh, you know, rather familiar question. Does time really heal and take away the pain forever? Uh, is there a final solution? So, um, I, time can bring down the pain. Definitely. Uh, but I think what is important is um, not processing that grief sometimes can make it stick or make it come back in uh, in different forms. So it is important to process it and not just allow time to, to bring down the pain. And that's why uh, going back to God with those emotions is absolutely necessary. So again, Yes, time uh, helps to bring it down, but it doesn't completely heal it. It, it is there in some remnant. And that's why you know, doing that grief process, having that process of grief is, again, important. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh, we are kind of out of time. So yes, let's. Uh, we would need to conclude. Yes, Lucy is uh, happy with that. Um, could we maybe? <laughs> Jean, would you be able to take the last question? Because Jeevan has a question here. How to deal with spiritual blockages? Um, in the sense, we do not feel like reading scripture, or maybe we may not feel like praying when we are going through a grieving process. So um, how do we overcome? How do we deal with these spiritual blockages when we are in pain and we are in the grieving process? I think that question is partly answered by Maui's question on spiritual risk. What is the spiritual risk that we go through? And I mentioned that one of the community really supports and helps when we are going through um, uh, those spiritual uh, issues. Just being able to uh, talk it out with somebody can really help us gain back some form of strength. So I think I partly answered that in the earlier question. True, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's just close with a word of prayer. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, for today's session. We thank you, O Lord, for uh, um, the answers that we could get, very practical answers that we could get on how to cope with and overcome grief. We pray, O Lord, that even when we uh, are in situations where we need to comfort and help those in the grieving process, you would enable us to uh, practice these tips and be able to be of practical help to people. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Jean, uh, for you know doing the session for us. And um, yeah, everyone, have a good day. Thank you.